Alhamdulillah, wa sallam wa rasulullah. We have a great honor and privilege to have a very special guest with us today. He is one of my guru or one of my teachers. But before I introduce him to you, today also is another celebration of the celebrity of Islamic Relief. Islamic Relief has been decorated over the last 35 years. Four times in the palace, four times in the palace by the OBEs. You see, Jangir, Wasim, Salah Saeed, and myself. But the academia are decorating Islamic Relief twice. Yesterday, the academia decorated your CEO, Nasr Haqq Hamid. Okay, who has got the honorary doctorate from Astor University. Before that, another one has been decorated also by another university. So two decorations from the academia, one of them for Nasser, the most recent one. The other one, I don't want to talk about him. Do no, you, want, I know. I you know him? Dr. Me. But, but this is uh, 2007, uh, quite old. Uh, what I'm saying, no matter what they say about you, keep achieving, keep progressing, keep covering, keep making milestones for humanity. And uh, the, the speed of decoration, six times in 35 years. I want you to increase it to five, four, till it becomes once every year. Once every year. If the older generation can make it six times in 35 years, you have to make it once every year. Commitment? Commitment? Inshallah. What is that? Not, not you, Khalas, you've done. Inshallah. <laughs> Commitment? Well, girls, girls, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. You have to be decorated. You have to be decorated either by the academia or the establishment. And this is the Islamic relief in action. Not only helping the people abroad, but, 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 putting your fingerprint here and your impact here. Now we're talking about the real hero. We're going to celebrate his presence with us here. Maulana uh, Kazi Isa. He is the uh, president and CEO of Pakistan Poverty Alleviation Fund, which is the, large, la, the largest semi-governmental uh, humanitarian and development fund in Pakistan. That's it. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Dr. Saab, I'm uh, truly, or oh, several Dr. Saabs here, I'm truly, truly, truly humbled by that introduction, but let me also correct Dr. Hani, if I may be allowed to. He is my Mahaguru, so <laughs> I've looked at him as an inspiration, and truly, uh, you know, I marvel at the achievements that Dr. Hani has been able to achieve in these last 35 years. I mean, this comes from commitment and passion. So. Uh, I'd like to say it's, uh, it's a real pleasure, privilege, honor to be amongst. This is a dream that we talked about that, you know, Dr. Hani has been always inviting me and now it has happened, alhamdulillah. So I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, sharing a few thoughts with you. And I think would be, if, if it's okay with you, and I'd also like to, sorry, thank, uh, you know, the, the CEO, Nasir Saab, uh, Had uh, Ahmad and Director Wasim Ahmad for inviting me. I'm grateful to bo both of you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for coming. So what I was told, I said, what, what is it that you guys want to talk about or hear? So he said, what are the challenges of Pakistan? Pakistan, like we all know, offers a lot of promise, but somehow we've never been able to realize that promise. And what are the causes of that? And I think we can talk about that. And, rather, and maybe talk a little bit about our work, but I don't want to bore you with those kind of details. I think it'll be more interesting for you and uh, you know, perhaps give you, we have a more interactive question and answer session or the kind of thoughts that you have, not only specific to Pakistan, but in terms of general collaboration uh, across institutions, because I think that is the future, collaboration, partnerships, that is the future. So let me just 
start off by giving you a, uh, sorry, you've got it? Oh, I've got it. So, you know, the good stuff and the bad stuff. And sadly, uh, the balance is a little skewed these days. Some of, I mean, there are a lot of Pakistanis in this room, I realize that, but perhaps sometimes we forget. So I'm just going to say, for starting off, Pakistan is a monster country. It's a huge country. People forget how big it is because when you're sandwiched between China and India, over a billion people, uh, Pakistan, or oh, it's a small country. Pakistan is now the fifth largest country in the world. 2008 million people, 2017 census. Uh, we are, have overtaken Brazil. Brazil was 192 million, so it is a very large country. So you need to do scale in a country like that. We've had some of the highest uh, fertility rates, 2.5. We have the, some of the youngest population, over 60% are below uh, 30. So it's a kind of a, and that's why I put it this, the youth in the middle, because it can go either ways. If, if the youth, which can be engine of growth, engine of uh, innovation, if they are not gainfully employed or they don't have, uh, the economic situation is not good for them, then they go down another path. So that's why I'm not even looking at it as a opportunity, that's a question mark what happened. The other thing, like I mentioned in the beginning, Pakistan, people forget how strategically located this country is. We are, we are in a way, the kind of, uh, surrounded, it's a very tough neighborhood, like I mentioned India, China, but then there's Afghanistan, we sit at the mouth of the Gulf, uh, all the Central Asian republics which are landlocked, the Gwadar port is the access, so huge opportunity, strategic, but a very tough neighborhood. We've had the Afghan war for the last 30, 35 years, 4 million refugees, you know, we've been hosting for the last uh, 35 years, so these are huge challenges. Then, so that's a, but still, because of the geography, I think it offers a great opportunity in terms of being the, the kind of the, the pathway for a lot of the Central Asian resources and everything. The other thing, which is kind of, again, we always have a question mark on, and this is kind of sad as well, that after 72 years, we finally achieved uh, something which was like one democratically elected government handing over to the next one. When the People's Party government finished its tenure, it handed over to the Muslim League government and this time around also handed over to the new government. So those are kind of hopeful signs. But again, uh, I don't want to go into the details, but then how much democracy there is and how much freedom there is, that's another issue. So let's look at it as a positive. The other thing, it's highly, you know, there's close to about 130 million or some say 150 million sims in Pakistan. So everybody is very connected to technology. That offers a huge opportunity as well. This is a very large country and pretty much everyone has or half the population have, have a cell phone. The other thing that Pakistan has done very well in is the, when the MDGs were signed and when we went back in 2015 to then report on the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, there was two targets that we met. One was the income poverty had been halved and we met that target. And the other one was the carbon footprint because we don't have many uh, coal-fired uh, plants, energy plants, we met that as well. But that was by default, not by any kind of plan and that maybe this time around we won't even meet that one based on the SDGs. As you know, we're all, all development partners and governments who have all signed up on this this is what we are going to be held accountable for mm -hmm. as countries, as individuals, as institutions, which is the Sustainable Development Goals. They place the bar much higher. And in fact, the SDGs are a validation of the work that institutions like Islamic Relief have been doing. We've been talking about much more nuanced approach to development where it is about inclusion and the values are there. It's about sustainable development. It's about taking care of the environment. And you see that peppered across the SDGs, 17 SDGs, 116 targets with all of these things which are raise the bar. And then the tagline, which is for me, finally, you know, the global world has woken up to and we have been all advocating for leave no one behind. That is the bottom line. And that is our approach to development, has always been our approach to development. Because when it is inequalities and inequities which cause the friction, the insecurity, the tensions, where people feel that they don't have a voice, 
they don't have a say in how things are done. That is absolutely essential. Now, like I mentioned, the fifth largest countries. Now, the other thing, and I'm going to give you some numbers, which are pretty scary numbers. Pakistan, when Pakistan was uh, born, when Pakistan became independent in 1947, Pakistan was one of the most equal countries. Pakistan was poised to, we had per capita higher than China, Korea, all of those numbers. So we were poised to really be, you know, again, the promise, the promise that has not been fulfilled. And as time has gone, as globally has happened, more and more inequity has happened in our country. So Pakistan is now becoming the most unequal country. So we have a Gini coefficient which measures inequality. We have a Gini coefficient of land ownership of 0.78. One is completely unequal, zero is all equality. So see where we have moved on that scale. It's pretty scary. And when I show you a map of Pakistan, you will see how it actually is pronounced in terms of the, in, in terms of the equality. Then the other thing which is so inequality in terms of regions, but inequality in terms of also, you know, how we've left behind huge segments of our population. They're, they're not represented, they're not, uh, they don't have voice. And the one that we are, as Pakistanis, I am the most ashamed of, is the how we have ignored our people, investing in our people, particularly uh, the women of Pakistan. You know, Pakistan, two years running, got second last on the gender equality index, which is done by the World Economic Forum. Yemen was the last, 144th, Pakistan was 143. And we have, two years running, we have maintained that 143 status. Of the size of this development, we have not invested in our people. And when I say people, if you look at the Human Development Index, Pakistan is 148 on the UNDP Human Development. It's again, you look at the education numbers, 23 million children out of school. Again, access to health, access to water. I mean, this it's not, not acceptable as a country going forward. The country with resources, people, you know, when you, when you look at some of the, the kind of the stars across the world, a lot of them, you know, be it the, be it the IT uh, revolution or whatever, there are Pakistanis at the forefront of it and they're reflected in all institutions, including your own institution as well. The other one, just a few, like financial inclu inclusion is absolutely essential if you want to make progress. Again, sadly, we have not done very well. Only 12% of women have uh, bank accounts, formal institutions, and I think about 20%, I've uh, probably forgotten the number, 20% have actually, uh, men and women have, ac have a formal banking uh, account. When you have, so the insecurity and conflict, as you know, the Afghan war has been going on forever. It continues to, uh, you know, fits and starts. There's hope and then there's despair and then we've not really found a solution. I think one of the reasons is we don't come to the table with good intent and say, you know, we all have our little agendas and say, you know, this is, I think when we come there and we need to have a different mindset, inshallah, inshallah, we all hope and pray that this time around it will be different. So that on the border plus the fact that we the inequalities that have caused a lot of the sense of deprivation i come from balochistan and i'll give you some numbers which will pretty i mean scare will scare you or kind of in a way hopefully goad you into action because the inequalities of the region is also one of the reasons that there is there is insecurity, there is conflict. You look at where the conflict is in Pakistan, it's in the Balochistan, it's in the tribal areas, all of those, it's in South Punjab. And it is, so this is no kind of, oh my God, why is this is happening? There's a direct link, there's a correlation between inequality, lack of services, lack of opportunities that are happening. And then, as if all of this was not enough, we were ranked seventh most vulnerable country to, to climate change. And you, Islamic relief, has been forefront in this regard and our partnership goes back to the, uh, the horrible earthquake that Pakistan su suffered. Pa uh, Islamic Relief was one of our key partners in rebuilding. We did 122 Pakistan Poverty Alleviation Fund with the help of seven partners, including Islamic Relief, built 122,000 seismically proof houses in Kashmir and, uh, and KP. And that is now, that climate change impact is manifested in droughts. So we either have too much water or too floods, too little water and too much water. 
earthquakes and then also there is this conflict which causes internally displaced people as well. So sorry guys, I, I know it doesn't, uh, let me just give you, uh, you know, I've talked about some of these numbers, but let me just give you a number in terms of the maternal mortality. Now just to really accentuate this point, like Pakistan has a maternal mortality rate of 170 per 100,000, which is pretty bad. You know, you have Sri Lanka with 30, and I think Bangladesh is 60, 70. You know, colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong. So Pakistan already, if you look at the overall picture for Pakistan, 170 per 100,000. And when you look deeper and you say, okay, this is the national uh, number. Let me look at what the statistic is for Balochistan. And Balochistan is six times the national average. Six times, that means 960 women die in childbirth out of 100,000. This is shocking, it's not acceptable. And I think we need to all take, it's part of our agenda to tell the story, to be able to convince people that, you know, you just can't ignore it. Ignoring things will never solve it. And I think sometimes a lot of people think, you know, let's just ignore it, let's you know, put it under the carpet, it'll go away. It won't go away, it'll just become worse and worse and then the, the thing will explode. No. Anyway, so just to give you one, uh, one other one, one example of this, and there are several uh, examples, but two, because I was in Dera Bukhti. So Dera Bukhti has been a lot of conflict in Dera Bukhti between the, uh, between the tribes themselves and also with the outside world as well. Uh, so this is a district which has provided Pakistan with gas since 1963. And in fact, so much so that the gas is called Sui gas. Sui is a place in Dera Bukhti where there is one of the largest gas wells. And the three largest gas wells, Pirko and Loti, they are also in Dera Bukhti. And there is no gas in, in that district, in those uh, tehsils. Like I went to Pahlavak tehsil, there are three tehsils, which is the next level from the district down, no gas for the people. They have provided gas to the rest of the country. So the sense of deprivation comes from this. Similarly, when I said, when I, uh, just going back, I mentioned CPAC. This is the new, every, you must have heard about it, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Now people call it the game changer. It can be a game changer, yes. But it can also be a source of further frustration and anger because if that, the effects, the benefits of CPAC are not felt by the local population, like uh, the Baloch in Balochistan or the other people who live there, then it will be a albatross around our neck because not only have we borrowed $60 billion for it, but we are, we are also causing further friction uh, within, within the country. So these things have to be managed because the Chinese are very clear what they want. But is Pakistan clear <coughs> what, what Pakistan wants? And how is Pakistan going to be able to generate the kind of income that will ensure that some of these returns, including the payments back, are, are done. I want, I mean, if somebody's interested, there's this huge IMF package which has put a lot of responsibility on Pakistan and is asking things which are really, really, I feel very, diff it, the economic situation right now is pretty, uh, pretty dire. You know, the stock exchange has lost five and a half thousand points since January. The rupee is in free fall. Uh, inflation has gone up highest in five years, 10% inflation. One uh, roti is 15 rupees. So if you have uh, six people in your home, uh, you buy, and everyone has two pieces of bread for three times a day, that means 16,000 rupees is just spent on bread. And the minimum wage in Pakistan is 17,500. So let me just, uh, I'm not gonna kind of bore you with, and I would like much rather have a more engaging, uh, you know, uh, interaction and questions. But a little bit about PPF, Pakistan Poverty Elevation Fund. The Pakistan Poverty Elevation Fund is a non-profit institution that was set up under the Security and Exchange Commission. It's, uh, it was set up by the government uh, with, and they took a minority holding in it. So three of the directors are from the government, nine are from the private sector. And what the idea was behind it was that we need to recognize the efforts of civil society. Because in all the other countries, there is a funding mechanism, be it bilateral money or uh, multilateral money, which was coming to civil society, which was supporting civil society. 
uh, sadly, unfortunately, Pakistan did not have that because Pakistan was always going from being least favored nation when we did the explosion, then the nuclear explosion, everyone stopped any funding, to the most favored nation when we were fighting the Russians. So that was the most favored nation status. So we have vacillated between these two. So there was no continuous source of funding for civil society. So this, the idea of the Pakistan Poverty Relation Fund was born. The government uh, took money from the World Bank and passed it on to us. They put in $10 million of their own, borrowed $90 million from, from the World Bank. And one of the things that we were tasked to do, because there was no microfinance sector in Pakistan, or very small microfinance sector in Pakistan, 60,000 borrowers and maybe four MFIs, which are microfinance institutions. So Alhamdulillah, this mandate was given to us and over a period of several years, because development is about the long term. Development is incremental. Development is contextual. Those are the, some of the key learnings that we felt that, you know, and particularly uh, you guys work across, I don't know how many countries, 30, 40 countries. You must know this, you know, how contextual things are and you need to be very aware of the context of where you work so that your intervention actually has impact and effect. So after 20 years, now Pakistan is, so this is a success story. Pakistan is rated as one of the best microfinance sectors in the world from 60,000 borrowers, four institutions, there are 7 million borrowers, there are over 50 institutions, uh, 10 of which are microfinance banks. We, all, we have also spun off our entity and created a for-profit for microfinance. So now we are doing basically subsidized work and grant work. And I'll just maybe take you through, uh, yeah, this slide is an important one. And then perhaps I can, you know, maybe take questions. There's Juma as well, whatever. So this, what we did was Cambridge University. We did this thing called the geography of poverty, saying, okay, because we're, it's a very large country, we need to be very strategic in how we, where we invest our resources. So how are you going to be guided by where should we invest our resources? And we said, okay, we did this uh, thing called the geography of poverty. And looking at government data, this is not... Primary data was government's data. This is all basically desk review of that data and came up with this map. So they looked at two or three things. One was the food security index. The other thing was the human development index. And the third was poverty. And they mapped all the districts. And the red ones are the ones with low human development, high food insecurity, and high levels of poverty. So that is red. Now, this is a little distortion because Balochistan is 44% of Pakistan. So large number of you know, the red and the orange, which is the next level of deprivation, and then green and blue. So, the bulk, so it doesn't mean that you know, Pakistan, uh, Balochistan has maybe about 7-8% of the population. So anyways, but still you can see that you know, all the red, and no surprises where the reds are. Balochistan, South Sin, parts of KP, Kohistan, uh, tribal areas, all of that. And then the greens, so even Punjab has along the kind of the west then side you have, you know, the districts of Rajinpur, DG Khan. So these, if you are from familiar with Pakistan, this comes as no surprise. It's just now being validated by authentic. So what we decided was that all our grant work we're going to do in the red and orange zones. The other thing we came up with, yeah, so for what PPF does. Now, because I said government, uh, development is contextual and, and incremental, what is the foundation that you build on? So, and that is absolutely essential. And it really warms my heart to see it when I walked into the reception of Islamic relief, that the values of Islamic relief were there. Very, very clear. And I would like to, you know, share with you that these are our fundamental beliefs as well, with a few kind of variations. But this is, the, uh, this is what grounds us. Everything, every intervention that we do, we will be measured against these values. Fundamentally, I don't want to bore you with all of them, but let me take the first one, which is an, uh, all of these are articles of faith. These are not negotiable. First one is inclusion. We are, even in Dera Bukhti, in Waziristan, we are going to work with women. If, okay, the context may be different, but there has to be a game plan. If the locals, they feel, sorry, this is our religion, this is our culture. I said, this is our religion, this is our culture. I don't want to change yours. Please don't change mine. We'll move on. Pakistan is a large country. But now after 20 years, people want to engage. People know, they trust the organization. So they say, okay, fine, let's, let's work together. 
So this is the value, not only just so like I mentioned earlier, we, and you have to measure it. So you can put the value on a, on, a, on a wall or on a document, but how do you measure it? And I think that is very important. So these are all mandated. How many, so I'm, I'll show you one, one slide in terms of every intervention. How many women did you reach out to? You know, how many of these asset transfers that you did went to women? How many of the disabled benefited from them? It is an inclusive society, a caring, a gentle society that we all strive for. The world is falling apart. Now civil society needs to lead. And these, what are we going to lead with? Our values. I think this transcends everything. It transcends, you know, race, color, religion. I, these values are universal values. So one of the things, and then the other four values, uh, I'll just quickly tell you because this is fundamental to our work, is inclusion is sometimes you have quotas, like you know, in the National Assembly we have a quota for women. That's not enough. You have to ensure that they have voice. And that is what participation comes in. So to include them, to make sure they're there, but they're also participating in decision making, that they are, have voice. Then we have the two governance values, which are absolutely essential. And particularly as our work expands and you work in very difficult uh, terrains and you, it's difficult to monitor, you have to make sure that, and you have to build in systems and you know, I'll be happy to talk about those later. Transparency and accountability, well, those are obvious ones. And the fifth one, which is a very profound concept, which is very much a concept which is based within our faith. That we are the stewards, we are the Khalifa of, we will, God will ask us, how did we treat not only fellow human beings, but all other living things? We are responsible, we are accountable to how we treated the animals, the birds, the trees, the water, the, you know, the air, we are accountable, we are the Khalifa. The, the Malik is, only he's the Malik. So this stewardship and every money, that, every asset that we have been provided, were we good stewards to it or not? So this is a concept which is, goes way beyond sustainability. This is a concept very much grounded in our, and in fact, all of these are grounded in our religion. In fact, we have a whole training program where we talk about how do you inculcate these values? Not only you start with yourself so that you can have the courage to look into other people's eyes and say, yes, we follow this. So like to just give you one example of the four top uh, management in PPF, the operations, the two operations are headed by women. So it's not only, okay, we have lower, lower tier, we, we track that and then we track regional disparity. We track how many people with disabilities do we have. Anyway, so our whole philosophy, and I maybe I won't give you, give you some numbers, but this, on this slide, we're saying, okay, we're gonna work in those areas, the tough areas. And then we, what we came up with, and this is a learning from, uh, from Bangladesh. And it was about, you know, how do you work with the, with the more hardcore poor, the very difficult, uh, what are the kind of things? And we learned from the BRAC that, you know, there is a way to work and then we adopted it. And we always try things small, you know, do pilots first, learn from it, see there is impact, and then say, because of this large country, you have to do scale. So we, we, we were one of the seven pioneers, countries and alhamdulillah. This study was done by Harvard, MIT, Yale, a consortium, and it came out in 2015, the results, in the Science Journal, and you can look it up, which shows that if you do this kind of graduation approach, then you can actually take people out of poverty. And this is something that, you know, I can talk more about it, but uh, basically taking the, Pakistan has a very large social safety net program, the Benazir Income Support Program, and that gives about $16 a month to uh, poor families, 5.4 million households. So we're saying it's not enough to give them a safety net. You need to give them hope. You need to take them to the next levels. Can they start their own businesses? Can they go beyond? And that we realize that if you give them an asset as a grant, that would help. And then once they got that asset, they have some kind of know how to use it, they may want to scale it up, then we give them an interest-free loan. So this is the big program now, the government has adopted it, and the third thing is vocational training. So the good news is that now government has fully endorsed this, and under their new ASAS program, this is very much center stage of that. We're giving out close to 18,000 loans every month. The first uh, was done on the 5th of July. So um, this is our kind of our strategy, our approach, our the way we engage. And then let me see if there's anything else. Yeah, we've linked uh, so our results break framework to this. These are some of the numbers. You know, it's a fairly large program, as you can see na nationwide. 
and um, I've talked about this as well. And it's just to give you an idea in terms of every, so everything that gets monitored gets done. Or if it does not get done, then somebody is held accountable. But if you just talk about these things and then there is no, you know, follow-up mechanism, then it won't get done. So if you look at, you know, all our, like I was mentioning, how central making sure that women is from, you know, the 8.4 8 million loans that we've given, 60% have gone to women. 65% uh, you know, interest-free loans have gone to women, and on and on and on. I think this is, this is absolutely essential. And I think what is very important, and it's good to see that you know, Islamic Relief has uh, invested in this. You know, the big, rather than tell your story, let others tell your story. Let the evidence tell the story. Let the work speak. I think it's, a lot of times, you know, civil society is about marketing, and this, this, is, not, this is not authentic. So what is important is, to, and like we said, we are constantly doing evaluating our work. Obviously, there will be things that are, have not gone well, but it also provides an opportunity for us to improve it, do course correction. So one should not be scared of saying, oh my God, you know, I don't know what this evaluation will... And development is notorious for this. The big multilaterals, bilaterals, say, what were the outcomes, guys? I'm not interested in how many schools you built or how many water supplied, who benefited, what were the learning outcomes? Did that uh, woman be able to send her children to school? These are the outcomes, and I'm not going to, I am not going to evaluate those, because then people will say, "Oh, your own organization." Obviously, you're going to tell good stories about your own organization. No, let the big institutions tell the story, like Harvard and Yale and University College London. We have an ongoing study with University College London, Lahore School of Economics, credible institutions that nobody will question their you know, that, okay, they're kind of fix it, it so that it suits, uh, a, you know, a narrative. No, it is a genuine uh, thing to, to find out more. How are we doing? How are we doing? How can we improve ourselves? So basically, this is like a continuous process, but along the way, and, you know, I, I did a tour, and Wasim took me around the tour, and a lot of emphasis on the due diligence. Absolutely, I think this is at, at the heart of it all, you know, gov be it from a community institution to, to you know, the institution at the top, you have to build into those systems. I know I can, so anyway. And then the last slide, okay. So this, what is, what drives you? So we came up with this virtuous circle that this is absolutely essential to have ish. And if you don't have the ish for this, don't, I think it's unfair on yourself, unfair on the institution to be, to be able to do this. And the ishq may be for, for not development, it may be for something else, but just follow the ishq. Yeah. Ishq is profound love. It is, oh sorry, <laughs> so yeah, so the, uh, the Urdu speaking ones would know and apparently in Arabic there is ishq as well and that is also, and perhaps Dr. Hani can talk about ishq. <laughs> he is a man of, with a lot of ishq in him. <laughs> so I think, so ishq is fundamental. This was came to me when I was, and deserts, you know, you have clarity when you're in a desert, there is no pollution and you're just there and you know, things come to you and so this, kind of came to me in a sense that, okay, what is it that we actually do and why do we do it? So that is the fundamental key ingredient is Ishq. But Ishq is not enough. Ishq needs to be tempered by knowledge, ilm. So if, you know, I have, so the ilm is of the people that you serve. You know, what, where do they go and fetch the water from? You know, what, hum, what is the issues that their livestock is? That is the ilm that will complement the Ishq. But both, you know, don't add to very much if they are not followed by amal, which is the action. And this is the virtuous circle. And the virtuous circle, to keep it refreshed, you have to make sure that you are close to the beloved, which is the people that you serve. The more you are there, the more the ishq will be there, the more the ilm, and then the ideas of, okay, so now I'm here, the, in Kharan, how do you provide the water, this, that, the other. You can't do it from an office in UK or Islamabad or Quetta even. You have to be there, sit with them, look into their eyes. They will guide us. We are just facilitators. We are not some gurus who will come and, you know, say pontificate and this is the way to... No, we are facilitators. Sadly, that person, that woman in Kharan doesn't have access to the corridors of power. We are surrogates. 
we are hopefully we are taking her voice her authentic voice to policy makers listen to her please we are just the kind of the conduits and then i think the second key element which is absolutely essential and dr hani said it so eloquently yesterday forget that the fundamental thing that prevents any of this happening is the ego the ana which stands in the way of collaboration of partnership of achieving outcomes and that ego we need to kill that ego every success that ppf has had has been because you know we collaborated we had partnership put on to it and molana room said it most beautifully as he does of for everything you know listen or drop give yourself up without regret so lose your identity that is the drop and exchange gain the whole ocean because if you lose your identity then i'm connected with everyone it's my 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 me 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 i i i which prevents this 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 thing to happen so ladies and gentlemen <laughs> thank you very much for your patience god bless you sir oh okay we need to sit in this one okay Uh, thank you and uh, we don't have much time what time we have to finish to wasim because juma yeah we need to finish now 5 minutes one o'clock will close okay so if you nasser can uh, say something before and i want you to make your question brief to kazi isa please oh, what do you want me to say why not bismillah thank you salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah kazi asma thank you very much for this presentation uh it was quite um interesting to see that a mixed uh, messages some things have improved in pakistan and some things are regressing um my question actually to you would be is that what role would civic society organization like islamic relief can play in addressing on the issues that are regressing especially given that um the space for civic society is shrinking and sometimes if you don't have the voice you cannot make some changes but then you risk of being shut down okay can, can yeah, we take so, another one two sure, questions yeah. Yeah, sure. please any other questions from you at least uh, kazi can I don't, i don't know why i'm here because dr hani can sit down no, <laughs> <laughs> no can, can we celebrate his uh, doctorate again <laughs> we'll, we'll get we'll get some some more We want a celebration every year from you. Without speak but love. If if the people who came from abroad could not be able to speak English properly like myself managed to do it and you are born here. We did it. I said uh, in 35 years I've got six decoration. Yeah. Our challenge is we need one decoration every year. You got it? You <laughs> then yeah, yeah and you sarah then uh, you child any other question yes brother bismillah my name thank you very much for an amazing presentation really really inspiring um i just like to commend to you uh, a a program in pakistan that we're running called voices on climate act, uh, climate and uh climate advocacy and learning um and th- this is really fitting in with your fourth uh, area of work that you put out in terms of working with provincial governments um and uh, decision makers academia uh, etc but with the islamic relief um, uh, motivation of bringing it from the from the grassroots so talking about the beloved and the people we're working for um what it's talking about of course is climate uh, and and the effects of climate change but also uh, it's the the questions that they're positing are about nature based solutions and i my question is how much is your organization regarding nature based solutions to poverty alleviation in pakistan thank you last question before uh, kazi isa would answer any lady to ask questions sister noor sister moon yeah that's a question about women in power yeah it's going bad ah Sister Christmas, Sister New Year. Anyone? Oh. In UK, women don't speak. They are empowered. They don't need to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said woman. <laughs> are you a woman? I'm representing. Ah. <laughs> okay.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kali Sahib. I think it's always inspiring. And uh, I remember two years ago, we have a 25th anniversary of Pakistan uh, office and Kali Sahib, our chief guest. And uh, that was really inspiring. And the grasp of the development issues that Pakistan is facing and the challenges. I think thank you very much. I think thanks for coming um, all the way from Nottingham. I was there yesterday. So, and I'm really glad. Uh, Kaisa was asking me what you want. I said that, you know, you just come and give us the talk and there will be uh, enough uh, a source of guidance and inspiration for us. Uh, regarding question, I think uh, <clears throat> obviously uh, Pakistani diaspora and organization like Islamic League, we have a long standing commitment in Pakistan, 25 years from north to south, from east to west of Pakistan and in some of the hard to reach areas, either it's Chitral earthquake or either it's a, a crisis in Fata or uh, in Balochistan or in uh, lower Sin, interior Sin. So I think what probably we need is, and I need your guidance and leadership on this, and yesterday we discussed this, bringing a lot of organization, civil society, play, especially national, at a platform where we can bring this new program, ESAS, at a level, at a granular detail. So really making sure that all the national players uh, are actually uh, in the same tune as the government put all these different organs of their social safety nets in one basket. So I need your uh, guidance on this and how do you see we can do and what is the specific role that my office in Pakistan can play? Thank you. So that's yours. Okay, thank Let you. me put it here, sir. Welcome to the Croatia. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. It's okay, I think I have a loud voice. This way. No, I am not... Uh... Well, it's fine. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. So, thank you for those questions. I am grateful and it's really... really <laughs> thank you for this opportunity, really appreciate it. So, for the first question, I think this is a very important question and we actually did discuss this yesterday as well. There were, I think, about 10, 12 organizations that were represented from the Muslim Charities Forum. And I think this is, the, this is the era of collaboration and we need to make sure that we need to collaborate on all kinds of levels. And I think you talked about the regression for, in Pakistan, let me just uh, come to that. I think though there has been a, a kind of a closing down of, uh, of, spa of uh, you know, people being able to civil society, one thing it has opened up is that on the space, but also of I think the faith-based charities and institutions, they have now been, are more accept, accepted. Or, so I think you have a, you have, you can take over that space, but then also with that comes responsibility. So I think uh, because the, every government, political government always looks to the diaspora, they're very conscious of the diasporas, you know, the image that uh, the diaspora has of them, they have clout and they, they, they want to not in a sense upset the diaspora. So I think that gives you a great advantage because these are all diaspora led institutions. And I think you, you have a real opportunity to raise the game and say, okay, this is fine. We'll do our, you know, if there are droughts and there are, you know, earthquakes, or whatever, God forbid, but we will help you with that. But also, I think, let's push the agenda on particularly things like women's empowerment, all of those things, which should be, which should be neutral. I mean, these should not be offending anybody, but somehow they do. But I think it's important when, it, when they hear it from you, Islamic Relief or other Muslim organizations, and say, okay, this is central. And how can you talk about, uh, you know, he, uh, the Prime Minister talks about the, the state of Medina, and we say, you know, we, do we know what the state of Medina had, you know, the kind of inclusion it had? And if we, if we are going to exclude the Baloch and the women and the disabled, then we can't make that state. We can't even aspire to that state. So I think we need to uh, have a narrative which resonates with this. And I think because of the scale that you have and the presence of 25 years gives you credibility, trust of the government, please leverage it. And we can, let's work together on this one because I'm, as soon as I go back, this is my <laughs> agenda going back as well. So, yeah, I think that's an important point that we need to. But at the end of the day, collaboration doesn't come with just talking about it. Collaboration with just, and we talked about actually physically collaborating, rolling up our sleeves and saying, okay, how can we take one district, one union council, and you know, three or four institutions come and play to their, you know, whatever value added they bring to the table. And I think I'm very, frankly, I'm very, very excited about that. 
so that is uh, <laughs> the question there, and thank you very much for that. And it's good to know that you have this program. I will certainly, uh, once I go back, find out more about it and how we can collaborate on that. Uh, if I understand, nature-based solutions, I think for me, uh, you know, th there is this ayat in the Quran which says, you know, everywhere you turn, you see the face of Allah, right? So for me, it's, it's about nature, right? So that is, and the, the further we go away from it, the less we are close to Him, I think. So nature is absolutely, is the place we get, I mean, I talk about myself, is get our, my inspiration from. Like I talked about the desert, or you talk about being close uh, <coughs> to in forests and all of that. So I think our, um, we have a whole training program in terms of how do, you know, that training program has quotes uh, and ayats from the Quran and other religions as well that how important nature is to the work of stewardship and we are the stewards and we need to you know hold ourselves accountable and ensure that we are very much in keeping with those uh, traditions and those you know ayats of the other religions as well because every religion this is fundamental to them so I think uh, in that sense uh, we have a whole uh, now a game plan in terms of our community, and it has to start from the bottom up. So the communities, institutions, we have a program with them of training, uh, you know, thousand master trainers who can have, who can engage with local communities and talk about the importance of nature, the importance of stewardship, the importance of, you know, climate change and how we are all responsible and how we are all accountable for that. <coughs> so, but we would certainly look forward to learning from, from you, from this program as well, and hopefully we can, we can collaborate on that. Uh, on Vaseem's point on the uh, on, uh, on ASAS, ASAS is a uh, ASAS is a big program. I mentioned it has uh, the livelihood. So ASAS has it's a kind of a composite program. There's a health uh, part of it. There's an education part of it, which is still being designed. That's not being rolled out. The first thing that would be rolled out in the health one will be a health card. But, uh, but in the livelihood program, which we've been asked to implement for the government, there are three components, and I mentioned those three components. And because we do not implement, as you know, we are a kind of an apex body, we use a partner. So like when the earthquake and we partnered with you and also partnered with you in, uh, in, in Baluchistan, I think uh, we, will, we already have 22 parts. Uh, the government has promised us more money, and then we'll put out a, a, a call for you know, getting more partners, and uh, Kashmir will be one of those places. So that is one way to collaborate. But I think that is a project collaboration, but I, I'd be more interested in a more wider collaboration in terms of learning, the, you know, doing research together, collaborating and saying, you know, co-creating and co-financing rather than say, okay, we give, say, okay, you bring your money, I'll match it with 50%. That makes life easy. So, you know, you not have to worry about FATF That's and all of those. Forward, yeah. That is the way forward. You know, let's, because one and one, the synergy is making That's 11, right? And I think we need to do that and consciously do it. And the only way anything gets done is if you measure it. So if you put your team and say, okay, guys, what did you do for, when you do your annual performance reviews? What did you do in terms of collaboration? I'm sure that they will do it rather than, otherwise we'll be come back to the same meetings and we'll be expressing our desire. But that desire needs to then turn into amal. <laughs> no, you want it back. Thank you. Just to conclude, uh, thank you, Kazi Isa. The journey of Nasruddin started from Eritrea, Saudi Arabia, first, or Egypt? Sudan. 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 Oh, Eritrea, Sudan, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia. Egypt. Egypt, Libya, Libya. Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia. UK. You okay? He took the challenges and the risks, and he made the risk. And this message for you, if you don't stand up for the challenges and take the risk, you will never be decorated. And you'll never be left, whether you are in the room or you are outside the room. When he came here, he had got to work in too many different places. Tell somebody kidnapped him, or hijacked him, or arrested him, or what else? The glass. Huh? Fooled him. Or fooled him. <laughs> Is that right, Brother Atallah? Have you been one of the people who have been fooled by, by this one? <laughs> and so it is risk taking and to meet the challenges and to pass these challenges with success. Nothing for free. Even Kazi Isa. Nothing for free for him. 
over his last 30 or 35 years, actually on his achievement, he has met all these challenges. We must stand up for the challenges, whether they are social, political, cultural, or nature, as you mentioned, inshallah. May Allah bless you and all of us. We thank you, Kazi Isa, inshallah. We welcome you and we are going to hijack you and leave you here. <laughs> thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.